So welcome to Real World Lessons, Writing Crystal Sea Bindings. I'm Postmodern, and uh, I'll be your presenter for the next 20 minutes. Got a lot of slides. Uh, we got 20 minutes, and I just drank a bunch of espresso. So let's get into it. All right, starting off, who am I? Um, I'm Postmodern. You know, you've probably have seen me on the internet, on Twitter, on GitHub. And uh, I have basically over 100 Git repos on GitHub. I'm quite busy. Uh, 20 of those happen to be Ruby FFI bindings, and I recently learned Crystal and decided to the best way to practice and kind of, you know, hone my skills were to start converting those FFI bindings over to Crystal C bindings. And so far I got four under my belt, and this talk is sort of kind of things I learned along the way. Well, okay, that's addressed the elephant in the room, why C bindings? Uh, why would we want to write bindings to C? We all know that C is, how shall we say, not the greatest language. It's about as sophisticated as, as a shovel. Um, why would we do, why would we care about C bindings to C libraries when we have this powerful language crystal at our fingertips? Well, turns out there's a lot of C libraries and that turns uh, converts into a lot of code. Um, Ubuntu has about 3.3 thousand packages containing C libraries and Fedora has 4.2 thousand packages containing C, libra C libraries. And though that's all code that we can leverage from Crystal uh, via C uh, uh, bindings without reinventing the wheel. Speaking of not reinventing the wheel, uh, a lot of these uh, bindings have non-trivial implementations. Probably a lot of you think, uh, well, a lot of those libraries, we could easily rewrite them in Crystal or, you know, we already probably have crystal libraries that would replace them. And for the most case, yes. But a lot of those libraries are very kind of non-trivial to re-implement. Uh, ask yourself, do you really want to rewrite a JavaScript engine like libv8 in crystal? Uh, do you have the time to rewrite a text-to-speech engine like libespeak and g in crystal? Or how about a cryptography library like uh, OpenSSL? OK, maybe OpenSSL is not the best example. Some of you probably would want to rewrite it. But also CBinds allow you to create, well, do powerful things like create native GUIs using GDK and QT, uh, do 2D and 3D graphics using SDL, OpenGL, and other kind of drawing libraries. Also, there's this new thing called Vulkan, which you know, I'm very interested in. You can also use CBinds to interact with the subsystem. So it's kind of the, you know, the place between the kernel and the operating system. Uh, to do things like capture network traffic, work directly with raw uh, audio uh, data, you know, both you know coming into through the microphone uh, jack, input jack, and you know the output jack. Uh, work with raw video streams from webcams and uh, you know video cards, video capture cards. You can also interact with hardware via libraries like libUSB. Uh, PCSC Lite, which is a smart card and RFID card reader library, and also libpci access, which I just stumbled across. So you can kind of mess with PCI uh, devices, which is pretty cool. And you can also do this. May the demo gods. Uh... Hold on, let me enable my video here. All right, can you see my video? Wow, that's cool. All right, I'm going to assume yes. Yes. All right, so what you're seeing, there's nothing wrong with uh, with Zoom or your uh, video or your monitor. What you're seeing is actually a live video effect done entirely in Crystal. You can see the colors warping. And what, what I'm doing is I'm actually using Crystal C bindings to get the raw video frames from the webcam and then do some math with the pixels and then write them back out and then pipe them back into Zoom. So this is all in Crystal. We're leveraging C bindings to kind of do the hard work for us and then do the cool work in Crystal. So yeah, Crystal C bindings, kind of powerful, yeah? All right, back to the presentation. Okay, so. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, um, we are all sold in Crystal C bindings. What is this talk? In a nutshell, it is what the Crystal book didn't tell you about writing C bindings. Of course, all of you have read the Crystal book. 
you know, it has a section on C bindings and it covers basic things like how to map functions and how to map C structures. Um, but it doesn't really go beyond stuff of that nature. What you will learn in this talk is a step-by-step -step methodology for writing crystal uh, C bindings in a very systematic method. Uh, so you can just churn them out. Uh, we don't have time to cover common gotchas and pitfalls and their workarounds, unfortunately. So maybe another time. So let's just get into the methodology. This is the methodology I came up with after writing all those Ruby FFI bindings. And I applied the same methodology to write all the crystal C, bind C bindings. So pretty confident in, in it. All right, step one, find the package. We need to find the package that contains the C library that we're wishing to bind to. And of course, you should be all familiar with these commands. Uh, basically just use your system's package manager to find the development package that contains the uh, library and header files and other documentation. And of course, on DB and Ubuntu systems, that's going to be apps. On Red Hat Fedora, that's DNF. That's their package manager. And Homebrew, you're, of course, probably, I'm guessing, everyone's familiar with Homebrew. One note, on Debian systems, development packages end in dev. And on Red Hat-based systems, they end in devel, because I guess you know their packages are made in the devel region of France. Um, if you can't find the package via a command line utility, uh, you can always go to uh, these websites online. Uh, all the package managers provide uh, a web interface to their uh, package repositories where you can search and narrow things down. And so usually easier to find it online uh, if you don't find it via the command line utilities. All right, random pro tip here. Let's say you know the library name already. Like let's say you're writing uh, C binds to lib Huntspell or lib uh, message pack or something like of that nature, but you don't know what package it's in. Okay, well on Debian based systems, there's a utility called app dash file uh, that you can just basically search for file names and it'll spit it'll return all of the packages that contain files that end in that file name. Red Hat based systems, same deal. Uh, use the DNF provides command and you just give it a file glob any path in any of those packages that match the file glob, it'll return that the package names. So easy way to track down, you know, if you're looking for a specific file, this is how you find it. Okay, so once you found your package, we need to just double check really quickly to make sure it's the right one before we install the wrong package potentially and, you know, waste a bunch of time. So get the metadata about the package, double check the website, read the description, you know, just making sure. All right, and then finally install the package. This is all pretty uh, basic information. You've all installed packages probably with uh, apt install or you know if you've used a Red Hat or Fedora system, it's DNF install. And of course, homebrew install, you're all probably familiar with that. And sometimes the packages you find, they may or may not begin with a lib, um, but they will either on Debian systems end in dev or on Fedora systems end in devel. Homebrew packages are named a little bit better. They're just named the, the project name. It's, you know, no weird suffixes or prefixes. Okay, so now that's installed, we need to actually find the shared library because we need to actually inspect it, and, you know, know what's there. On uh, Debian and Ubuntu systems, they recently moved to this multi-arc file structure. So all of your libraries or all of the C libraries are going to be installed in USR slash lib slash x86 64 links GNU. It's weird, but it's so they can support multiple architectures and multiple different lib C's and stuff like that. On Red Hat Fedora systems, it's a little simpler. It's going to be in USR slash lib 64 because, you know, uh, Fedora and Red Hat, they've kind of moved to 64 bit operating systems primarily. On Homebrew, since it, everything's installed in USR local, it's going to be in USR local lib. One minor note that I always forget, Linux uh, systems use .so for their shared libraries, which stands for shared object, and Mac OS uses uh, .dilib, so minor difference there. Next, you're going to want to find the header files. So um, these header files will be very useful when you start translating uh, the C library kind of functions and structs over to the Crystal C bindings equivalents. On uh, Linux, it's going to be USR include. And on Homebrew, it's going to be USR local include. And sometimes these header files may or may not be uh, named uh, 
like foo.h or libfoo.h, or it might be a directory called foo or libfoo. You just have to search around in the directory to figure out where they're kind of roughly installed or you know, look at some example code. So here's this random pro tip I discovered. Uh, that's so you know the library name, you found the library, but you don't know where the headers are because they've you know, installed them in a weird location or some sub, sub, sub directory. What you want to do is basically dump the symbol table of the library, which shows all the exported function names, and then take any of those function names and just recursively grep uh, for it, and you'll eventually find the header files. So on Linux, that's uh, the nm command, dash capital D, and you just want to grep for everything containing space, capital T, space, and that will give you all the symbols that are exported from the uh, shared library. On Mac OS, you want to use the O tool dash capital L command, and that'll do the same thing. And then just pick any function recursively grep uh, for it in the include directory, and you'll find your header files. Okay, next, probably a good idea to find the API documentation. Uh, this will come in handy when you actually have to start using your C uh, bindings after you've mapped them in uh, to actually you know, pass data to them and get data back from them and check error codes and stuff like that. The API documentation will explain how to do that. Uh, sometimes it will be in the header file because uh, they left it as you know, kind of documentation comments. So above the, uh, each function de uh, declaration. Uh, other times they may install or ship a section three man page. Uh, section three is for all kind of general purpose uh, C functions. So, uh, and if they didn't install a man page, you can always search online at, um, you know, man pages, org or man pages, ubuntu.com or any of the other man page index websites where you can, you know, search all the man pages. And if it's not there, you can always check the project website. Usually they have uploaded their own documentation that they generate. Uh, and if all else fails, Google. Documentation has to be out there somewhere. Okay, so now that we have everything gathered and collected, we got all of our information, we know where everything is, it's time to begin translating from the C header file over to the crystal C binding syntax. Now, I like to do a couple things just to keep things a little more organized and easier to read and hopefully maintainable down the road. Uh, if someone else comes across my library and uh, maybe they're trying to debug something. So I like to keep C bindings code in source, li li source libfoo and then the regular crystal code in source foo.cr in the usual char directory structure. I also like to keep C header file names and the C binding file names as one-to-one -one as possible. That way, if so, there's a random additional file that I had to create to map in some additional declarations uh, from C, uh, someone will look at it and they can infer by the name what header file that those things came from. And of course, I like to name the lib namespace libfoo so it doesn't clash with our top level foo module that we'll use it for the shard. And I like to convert all C type defs, constants, and macros into crystal aliases, constants, and macros to preserve any meaning that's inferred either by the type names or kind of the logic that's in the macros, because sometimes there might be subtle logic there. So I want to preserve that so nothing's lost in translation. And of course, preserve any important C comments. A lot of times there'll be documentation in C comments or warnings about things or how to deal with certain errors or bugs. So I feel that's important to copy over into our crystal code. So in case someone is debugging something, all that information is still there. Nothing's lost in translation. So here's an example, some C type defs uh, from a library that I recently wrote crystal bindings for, uh, v4L2. For, uh, and of course, they're aliasing these weird S32 and U32 uh, type defs uh, for some reason. And here's those same type defs converted crystal. All the names are same. We basically, uh, and the structure is roughly the same. We basically just change the syntax a little bit. So it's very readable. And here's some example C macros uh, for defining ioctal codes, some really kind of messy stuff and some weird bitwise operations. And here's those same uh, macros converted to crystal. And of course you can see we've 
preserved all the names and we preserved kind of the logic that's built into these macros. And we also preserve the file name structure. So some C programmer looks at this, they're gonna quickly figure out, oh yeah, that's that looks like a header file name. I get this. And here's some example C constants using those previous C macros uh, to define some IO octal, some IO octal codes for dealing with terminal stuff. And you know, you have to pass some literal data to them. And here's those same constants defined in crystal using our previously cri defined crystal macros. And basically it's, it's, it's the same. We just change syntax a little bit. So it's very readable, keeps things nice and tidy. So now that we have finished writing the C binding mappings, um, so everything's mapped in and all the functions and all of the structures, all that stuff, uh, it's time to write a hello world uh, library, I mean, hello world uh, program, uh, just to make sure that things build and they run. Typically, a C library will contain some type of simple function that you can call like a, a version function that returns a static string or in C terminology, that's a const char pointer. And basically, we just need to call it, convert it to a string and print it and see if it builds and runs. If it does, you're good to go. So now, it, once you pass the hello world stage of C bindings development, it's time to maybe port a more complex program. So find a example C program that uses the you know, C library and try converting it to your crystal bindings. And this will help you get a better idea how to actually interact with the library, how to call the functions, how, you know, what data that's passed to them and what data is returned from them. And this will give you a better idea how to structure kind of the, the, the crystal shard itself, what modules and what class additional classes you need to write to make it a little more crystally. Um, yeah. So once you actually have some code forming together and you know things are starting to work and you're starting to get data back from the C library, and you're starting to you know be able to actually use it for its intended purpose. Uh, it's time to put some final touches on things uh, just to wrap up the code and you know make it more uh, you know, consume consumable uh, by other developers. Things I like to do uh, is wrap any persistent structures or unions in classes, as we all know. Uh, Crystal structures are uh, allocated on the stack, and if you pass them, they get passed by value. So wrapping them in a class allows them to be stored on the heap and be a little more persistent and garbage collected, and then you can pass them uh, by pointer to see any additional classes, modules, top-level methods. You know That's basically just making your uh, C bindings more like a, shard, a traditional crystal shard that's kind of easy to use. You don't really have to have, the, the developer doesn't have to have uh, intimate knowledge of the C library. It's all wrapped up for them. And of course, write tests. We're not actually testing the C functions. We're just testing our code that wraps around them. So making sure that all works. Add documentation, of course. You know, documentation is always good. Add examples to the readme. You know, make sure that someone using this library can you know, uh, get up to speed really quickly and maybe even have a couple sample programs. Um, and of course, add installation instructions to the readme. If we did all that work to find the packages, it's kind of a good idea to kind of just give example commands on, you know, what's uh, apt install or dnf install or brew install command you're going to need to run or a user is, is need, uh, going to need to run to install the library and be able to build the C bindings and stuff like that. And of course, finally, tag it. You know, uh, cut a release, make sure that now the rest of the crystal kind of community can use your wonderful C bindings. All right, so here's some examples real quickly. Uh, here's how to wrap a struct. We're basically just defining, we're uh, creating a new C structure from our C bindings and assign it to an instance variable. Then you can define additional methods that inspect the struct or modify it in place. And then you have a to and safe method, which automatically converts the structure back to a C primitive. In this case, it's just a pointer to the struct memory. So we can just pass this any object of my struct to a C function and to unsafe will handle the rest for us. Here's an example readme of the installation section. Um, again, just you know, figure out what uh, different libraries need to be installed on different operating systems and come up with the apt git install command and 
DNF install command and brew install command and any other package managers you can think of. And that helps users out immensely. So in conclusion, now you can write crystal C binds in a systematic and efficient way. Uh, we didn't get to cover common pitfalls and gotchas, so ignore that. And you can also now help the community grow uh, the sh uh, crystal shard ecosystem uh, by writing lots of crystal C bindings and unlock powerful functionality. Or, so I would like to say powerful functionality, power. Okay, so that is the talk. Uh, I guess we can now progress to Q and A. All right, thank you very much. That was super instructive. Um, so anyone has any questions? Here we go. Looking at the chat, uh, Johannes no, Mueller okay. uh, basically pointed out that you can declare crystal, um, you can declare external library dependencies in the shard.yaml using the library's property. I missed that. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Ian asks, how should you include uh, .so if it is not available to be installed via package? Aha, good question. So if it's not in the package manager, you're essentially going to have to usually build it by sor uh, from source. So download it, and usually the Unix way, quote unquote, of doing this is you download it into a USR local slash SRC, and you extract it. Usually it's a, you know you download a tarball, and then you go through the installation, uh, the compilation uh, steps that are listed in the README. And you then run, usually there's a make file and stuff like that. And you run make install as roots. And that will install it into USR local lib or lib64. And these lib directories are also searched when um, programs are compiled, uh, when you specify a dynamic a shared library. So it will be picked up that way. Um, I would not recommend installing libraries into non like standard Unix locations because then you have to tell the uh, program where to search for them. And that usually involves using a environment variable in Linux called LD, pre, uh, was it LD library path? Um, but yeah, so just install the USR local and you, you should be good to go. All right, uh, do you see the Q and A? Do you have access to it? Um, hold on. Oh, there's two in there. Okay. So Solomon says this is a bit specific, okay. but why should the to unsafe method return a pointer to the struct rather than the struct itself? Okay. Yes. So when you pass a struct. Uh, well, first, a lot of these libraries, they usually will force you to either pass a pointer to the struct to the function, because that's how the function is declared. So you have to do that. Um, now, C libraries typically do that. It's common for them to use pointers to structs instead of the actual struct value. The reason why is because usually these structs are quite big. And when you pass by value, each individual byte or word of the struct memory has to be copied onto the stack. And if you return a struct, then it also has to copy onto the stack. So that can be a performance uh, hindrance. And so you'll want to basically pass a pointer to that memory instead. Um, so that's, that's the reason why. Uh, also answering uh, uh, Kafa Asa. I'm probably mispronouncing the name, so apologies. Why is it hard to integrate with C++? Aha, great question. So C++, because it's they, inter they introduced this whole class-based system, they use what is called name mangling. And so when you actually dump out the symbols of a C++ binary or library, you'll find that the function names begin with this kind of ASCII garbage, you know, usually Z, 3, X, L, whatever, and it's completely random, unpredictable. You can't like actually calculate it. Um, so that kind of makes knowing what the function names are difficult. And that's what's preventing us from binding to the um, C library, the, the traditional manner. Now, 
there is now a lot of C libraries do for backwards compatibility is they define an extern C section. And that allows um, the, C the C++ library to then define like plain C functions that then you can bind to using the traditional C bindings methods. So that's how you do that. <laughs>